our next speaker will talk to us about uh, Swiss UI. Uh, Craig Clayton is a self-taught senior engineer, senior iOS engineer at Farreach, Fanreach, specializing in building mobile experiences for NBA, NHL, CHL, and NFL teams. He was also an organizer of the Suncoast iOS Meetup Group in Tampa, St. Petersburg area for three years preparing presentations and hands-on talks for this group and also for other groups in the community. He is also a co-author for the Swift for Good book, a project, just like I said, created by Paul Hudson and that raised over $60,000 for charity. He's launching a new website called Design to Swift UI, which specializes in teaching developers and designers on how to build iOS apps from design to Swift UI. He's creating a lot of video tutorials in the process. Craig, please take it over and tell us all there is to know about Swift UI. Awesome, thank you. All right, everyone sees my slide. This is my first time using deck set and Windows, so just wanna verify you guys see my intro slide. Yes, you. Do. All right, cool. I love giving a talk after Ellen because then it makes me step up my game. So hopefully I'll um, I'll be uh, make her proud. All right. So as you know, my name is Craig. Uh, I work for FanReach, uh, which used to previously be Adept Mobile. Um, we we specialize in um, sports apps mainly, um, but we're we're um, expanding into other other fields. Um, right now we do NHL, uh, NBA, NFL, CHL as well. And um, so most of my day is spent uh, dealing with pretty much um, videos and news articles and statistics and live feeds. Um, CHL, NHL, and um, those two in particular, actually our service uses GraphQL. Um, NFL still on old feeds and they're gonna be switched over to GraphQL in the next, I would say not this year, but next year. They're making the jump over. Just to give you guys an idea, we were using feeds and now we're on GraphQL as well. So um, I have written uh, three books, iOS 10, 11, and 12. Um, iOS 13 programming for beginners and iOS 14 programming for beginners is still out there. Um, and the guy took over the book. He made some edits and now it's his name. Both of our names are still on it, but, um, if you see my name on it, ask him, not me. Um, most likely it's still the same stuff as far as I can tell. Um, but he, he's more familiar with that book. I've moved on to Swift UI projects, which I'm hopefully will officially be done in the next seven days, or at least by next next Wednesday this time, I hope I'm chilling and not doing anything, um, which will be the most exciting thing that I can say, uh, at least for like two or three days, and then I, and then I have to do something. But um, Switch UI Projects is basically um, an iOS app that is, sorry, uh, a book that's based on building two watch apps, two iPhone apps, two iPad apps. Um, is some chapters cover two chapters, which would be one chapter strictly on design, and then one chapter on some kind of data or structure. And my talk today really is going to hopefully not be very technical. Uh, that's my goal. Um, it'll get technical at the end, but I, I honestly, everything that I'm gonna tell you is just high level. So you don't need to worry about what's on the screen. Um, I want you to understand is that one, it's simple code and two, um, just a little learning of Swift and Swift UI and you can do these same things. Um, as you heard earlier, I'm working on a new site and I'll be starting hopefully the following weekend, starting to create videos on this particular mini course. Um, it says out in October, I really wish it was, but it's not, it's probably gonna be closer to the end of November, December when I can get this out, but it's going to cover um, from beginning to end, how to build a flight app. If you're interested in learning more, more information will be coming out in the next coming weeks. Um, 
and uh, you can join my email list and get all the information about it. But basically this, um, I'm still actually working on all the details of what I'm gonna cover, but the idea will be um, you'll, you'll learn animations, you'll learn Swift UI, you'll learn how to do all of the designs and prototyping, and then we'll jump into um, getting data into it and all that good stuff. So this is the outline for today. We're gonna go over the pros and cons of Swift UI. And it, again, high level. So you, you don't need to know uh, anything about Swift UI, and I hope you don't, because all we're gonna talk about are really just high level topics that um, some de developers know, some de developers don't. And then at the end, I'm going to give three live examples where I'm gonna live code um, my pros and why I feel that you should. And there's actually one bullet point uh, missing, which is why you should learn Swift UI. So we're gonna start with the cons. So first of all, hopefully at this point, you're either excited or you're scared. And uh, hopefully it's not the latter, um, but we're gonna get into it. And again, uh, just sit back, relax. Um, I was about to drop like Snoop Dogg, you get your gin and juice on, but uh, for now, at least don't get your gin and juice on because you might be twisted at the end and you won't know what you what I'm talking about. So at least wait until I'm done. But let's get started. So the pros and cons of Swift UI. So we're gonna start with the first con, which are uh, layouts are no longer using auto layout. Now, to me, this not necessarily a pro or a con, but to a lot of different people, um, this is a this is definitely a con, and mainly because of the way constraints are handled in Swift UI. So if you're coming from a different programming language, if you're coming from UI Kit and you do know UI Kit, but you just don't know Swift UI, it's a different mindset. So you really have to not come in thinking UI Kit. That's that's the main thing. And so when people do, this is this is what happens. They're trying to make it work like auto layout would work or however they would do it in programming. Now, um, Sometimes it makes building some UI harder. And, and I say some because um, it actually, to me, I've used, I'll, I don't really use any libraries. Um, if you've used UI kit before, there's tons of libraries out there for it. And I'm sure there's still, there's probably some out there already starting for Swift UI. But honestly, once you learn it and you understand the base core of it, 90% of what you're trying to do, you can do on your own. You do not need a library or any help, to be honest with you. Um, and the, the building of some UI harder, also the con I would say here is um, in iOS 13, we didn't have grids. So um, you kind of had to go outside the box and use four each's. Um, in iOS 14, we now have grids. So that's kind of something that got added on. But in the beginning, not everything that was handled in UI was brought in. So if you didn't have that particular UI, you can bring in UI kit into your project. Again, some people want to go pure Swift UI, and it's not at that point yet, but I would say it is now in iOS 14, um, at least if you're going to go iOS 14. If you're going to go 13, which is where our, my apps that I work on support, then I'll probably use like... Um, collection views and uh, compositional layout until I until iOS 14 has more stuff to for I that I can use and then I'll go strictly uh, Swift UI. So again, uh, this kind of goes into what I was just referring to as in, um, you must be on the latest iOS 14 for all of the latest features such as match geometry. And a lot of this is technical talk, but again, th these are things you can Google. Um, match geometry is basically, um, think of, I set up a, a starting animation, I set up an ending animation, and then all I do is say, this is where I want to start and end, and Apple handles everything in between. And um, if you've ever done action script, it's exactly like that. So um, you tween between one animation and another, and really the tween is you create a view, and you create another view, and you basically just give match geometry some IDs, and you're done. So these features are coming out more and more and more and more people are getting a hang of it as it starts to now finally be in uh, Goldmaster. And so you're gonna see more people doing these kind of things that are coming from Match Geometry and you're gonna think, if you think of UI Kit, 
UI kit animations were a pain in the ass, excuse my language, they are not now. All right. And earlier, as I said, missing UI elements is on the release. So some of the things are, are, are not there and some things are. And so you just kind of have to work around it. For me, I figured out what I what I have and what I don't. And then I um, base my designs on that. So if I have to tweak my design a little bit, I do. Um, but again, to me, it's it's night and day. Like I absolutely love Swift UI. Obviously, I wouldn't be giving this talk, and um, I feel like it's something that you should you should get into. It's very similar to what Android's getting ready to. Um, well, I shouldn't say getting ready to. Android has been working on with Kotlin. Please say the name for me, Ellen. What is the name of Kotlin's version of Swift UI? Kotlin. Kotlin native uh, and, and um, sorry, uh, it's uh, uh, Jetpack Compose. There you go, Jetpack Compose. My coworker actually has been working on it and uh, we go back and forth. But uh, if you're looking, if you're a Droid user, um, it's the same kind of concept and you, you'll see soon. All right, um, and then the last, I would say, big thing is Combine has a decent learning curve and, and I'm probably being very lenient with that word decent and it probably has a very hard learning curve. Um, but once you climb that, that mountain of learning, it really does open up so many more things to you. So right now you're probably like, um, so you told me all this crap, now why should I learn it? So let me go through really the pros of why Swift UI is beast. My first one is it makes building UI, most UI easier. And when I say most, I'm talking 90, 95% of your UI. It's way easier. Um, you, once you get past how things are laid out, it, it does make it simple. You can give me a layout right now and I could probably do it in less than an hour. You give me the same layout in UI kit and it'll take me an hour to set the damn project up in UI kit and storyboard and then I'll get to it, which will probably take me like two or three hours. I'm still pretty good at UI and storyboard, um, but my point is, is that you literally can crank out designs and UI and prototypes in no time. Uh, and it's much easier and faster to code. And when, when I'm saying faster to code, I'm literally saying if I needed a collection view in iOS, uh, I would take me maybe 15 minutes. If I need a collection view in Swift UI, I'm talking two minutes. That's the difference. Um, and there's a hiccup there, but um, it's easier to prototype. As I said, I can literally prototype my entire app and not have to worry about data at all. So again, if you're looking for the ease of use, for me, that's how I work. That's how my book is set up. Everything is, you prototype first, uh, we get the design ready, and then you move on to data. So the way that I see it is, if you're a company that has a bunch of designers who like to code, especially now, you can have them do your designs, all the prototyping for you. They hand over everything for it to you with fake data. And then all you have to do is just substitute out all the data. And that is that is where I see a lot of use and a lot of benefit. You can't really get away with that with table view. You can't really get away with that with collection views. You can get away with that here. And so that's really where, um, uh, to me, Swift UI shines and the ability to build apps that are, you can pretty much put an app in someone's hand that has fake data within a couple of days if it's a, you know, four or five page app. And this one is, is probably the one thing that people don't talk about enough is the interactions are way more simplified. State, the state driven um, code that Apple brings to Swift UI really takes a lot of the programming away, like a lot of the logic and difficulties that you need to do. It's, it really does make it easy using Swift UI. And you'll see, I'm gonna create um, an interactive card that you can change colors uh, on the card. And that in, in UI kit would take you so much time to come up with your own logic. And you'll see that I'll be able to do the logic in less than five steps. And that's the difference between switch UI and UI kit as far as logic goes. Here, 
Um, again, animations are simplified. This one here is by Amos, who's on Twitter, and his handle is there if you want it. If you go into either his Twitter or GitHub, you can find all of this stuff, he's shared it and the code is on the left and what he's doing is on the right. And literally I've learned a ton from him as far as animations and just understanding things. But again, it's simple. It's not, especially once you learn it. I think a lot of people are scared of animations because of their past with dealing with it in UI kit, but really animations that like once you get the concepts, you and you you have to. There is going to be a, a little bit of a learning curve, but it's more just learning what you can do and how you can incorporate it. And it's not like the learning curve of combine. Um, as I said earlier, it's team friendly. Now um, designers are more apt to want to do things. Uh, last year, I would say January and in February, I taught a week long class to designers for swift ui just designers and they were loving it um i made it custom specifically for them so they would tell me what they're looking to do how they want to uh, how they wanted to work things out and so i i taught them how to do animations i taught them how to set up their views and their designs and then they were able to go and take their own designs and bring it into swift ui and they and by the end of the class they were comfortable doing these things so again it is definitely designer friendly swift ui is not uh super technical it's not hard to understand and if you go through it slowly i'm i promise you most your most designers will actually enjoy using it at least i the ones that i've taught so far and um the other part of this is that swift ui is declarative syntax and you can kind of see the what the code looks like in the slide it, it might be a little bit smaller but right here what we're what we're saying is is that um we're telling the ui what you're telling the ui what you would like to do for example um you can write that you want several text fields and then enter all of the finer details uh such as the font alignment and um of each field and that's the great thing about the, the declarative syntax versus what we were doing in ui kit so again different mindset different things you really have to just come at it with a different approach and again it's great and um the other huge thing that um it works when it wants to i would say 90 not even that um i'd say probably 75 percent of the time swift previews works um most of the time it doesn't work because of me um and so and it's more education so there's certain things that if you do things with um observable objects which again is technical but if you do things with observable objects and your code and you um have a view it needs to know about it otherwise it chokes and but it doesn't tell you so those are kind of the minor things and the more you use it the easier it gets um but the fact that i can sit there and look to my right and see everything rendering the way that i want and i can just keep going and just adding things and then i don't have to keep pushing play or or run to see what the design looks like and not and the, not even just run but let's say it's a detail view that's three clicks in i'm i'm literally can just see it here and know that i i have confidence in what i see is what it's going to be when i run the app and of course every design uh depending on how you code is going to be a little slightly different because again you got to make sure your your ui fits on different and different sizing but again once you get comfortable with this you'll be uh, for me, I don't actually use, like here you see an actual device. I don't use this because this is kind of misleading, um, especially when you're working with smaller views. And the more you start doing Switch UI, you'll start to understand that it's not the the view um what you see isn't really what you're worried about you want to like i want to see it in a large view because then i know it'll expand and then i know when i make it smaller it will go to the small size so um in swift ui i can create two previews i can create one that's a 600 in width for like let's say a landscape and then i can create a portrait and then i can look and then as i'm coding i can see both of those views at the same exact time and know that i'm doing the right thing or coding it the right way so again swift previews really does help and make uh your design life easier um officially on ios 14 this has been native to all platforms and the only caveat i would say is 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 really watch um 
it's native in all platforms in iOS 13, but watch wasn't fully Swift UI until this year. And then the last one is, uh, we have now have a native solution for reactive programming. And again, I, I had this as a pro and a con. The, the con is that the learning curve is steep, but the, but the pro is that we don't need, we don't have to use um, someone else's reactive and Apple has made it simple and works with theirs. And um, as they, as it grows and it matures, I think this will be even better. Um, one of my favorite persons who who actually does a lot of combine is Donnie. And um, he, if you don't know him, Donnie Walls on Twitter, he's like, he actually just did a YouTube channel today where he just jumped on randomly and just started um, taking questions and just coding straight up. And their video is out there, it's dope. Um, I went in there, asked a couple of questions and got him to write some stuff. But again, um, it's, it takes a little time. And for me, it's great because I can watch those again and again and just get get a better grasp of it. I understand what I'm writing, but I don't always know how to get there. And so, you know, he he's really good with uh, explaining things. He um he went the PAC route as well. He wrote three books for PAC publishing for advanced programming at the same time I was writing beginner. And then he released his own book um, for Combine. So just you can check them out. It's called Practical Combine if you're looking uh, to get into it. So right now you're probably like, can this really be true that uh, it's Swift UI is this simple, you know? Yes, it's true. Yes, it is. I promise you. And I'm going to show you, as I said, I'm going to give you three examples. Um, the first one is going to be a uh, layout. Um, technically is not really layout interaction. Um, the yeah, interaction, and one of those is wrong. So we're gonna deal with interaction, we're gonna deal with animation, and then we're gonna deal with, I changed the last one to be combine. So it's really gonna, um, we're gonna look at how uh, combine works and using that with views and the two together really make things um, pretty dope. So I am done with slides and I'm gonna go towards showing my screen and working on showing you more of a demo of this. All right, I got a lot going on. So let me just get it out of your way. All right, so my first example today is going to be animations. And the I, I should have shown you what it what it looks like. Greg, yes, I don't sir. Know if you're, you're not sharing. Okay, what thank you for to. telling me that. Let me. So we see lots of windows. Oops. Can you see my screen now? Yes, now. Got it. Okay, so here we go. We got um a very. This is Xcode. This is our preview. If I if I go ahead and hit resume, you're going to see a text uh, animation one example appear, um, and that's it. So we're gonna. Oops. Let's keep that here. So first thing we're going to do is or we're going to create a airplane that's going to um, animate on an arch. Well, at least it's going to appear that it's animating on an arch or a path. So the first thing we're going to do is create our path. So here we're just creating a simple path that we want um, our um, plane to kind of ride on. And we're just using a circle and, and trimming it down and getting it to be where we want. Um, our next step is, oops, is to create a, the airplane. Now in, in Swift UI or with Apple in particular, we have what's called um, SF symbols. And I'm, this is what I'm using. It's just a, a graph. A graphic of an airplane. And right now it's giving us an error and I'll fix that in just a second, but we have our airplane. Now we're going to make, I want to make two dots, like where it starts and where it ends on the plane or the path. So we'll create the first dot. This will be our arrival. And then we're going to create another dot, which is going to be our destination. 
All right, so we have two dots, right? We have an airplane, we have a path. Now, again, the code isn't long. It's not, it's not overly complicated. Yes, every line I'm not explaining, but I just want you to see. So the first thing we're gonna do is we have to create a variable for the animation. And so we're gonna say at state, um, private var motion equals false. And that will get rid of that error that's happening here. And so what I'm telling this airplane is when motion is true, I want you to rotate on this degree. And that's all I'm telling it to do. And here you can see on a pier, we're toggling the true and false. So right now it's set to false. As soon as the view appears, it will then toggle itself to true. Um, but we need to get all of our assets onto the screen because right now we're just displaying text. So we're gonna say, add all of our stuff. And we're putting everything into a Z stack. And so just roughly what a Z stack is, is it means it can, you can stack things on top of each other and move them around in the uh, anywhere you want. Um, we have two other stacks, one called an H stack, which means it displays everything horizontally. And then we have lastly, one stack called a V stack, which displays everything vertically. So those are the three main stacks that we, that you can use within Swift UI. And so that's what you see here. We have a Z stack with a color. And when I hit resume, my whole screen will turn black and you will now see all of our assets on the screen. Boom. So the airplane is already at the position of the end. So when I hit the play button in uh, previews, it'll the plane will go back to the start point and start from the beginning and animate all the way across the screen to the end and repeat. And again, I didn't write a ton of code. And honestly, this path is not even necessary. The path is visual. So if I comment out the path and I hit play, it's still going to animate. And the dot is, so everything you see here, I could get rid of the departure dot, the arrival dot, and just have the airplane. And that is the only thing that is actually animating. Everything else is just stacked underneath the plane to give visual representation to the user. Again, Swift UI makes things way easier. So that's my first example. Let's go to my next one, which is interaction. So we have this view here. And the idea of this view is we have this credit card and the users, let's say, signing up for Citibank and they're going to, um, they're picking the card that they want and the color they want and they're going to see their name on it, whatever. So I got rid of all the card data stuff because that's useless at this point. And I just wanted you to see this. So right now, if I hit play, no, nothing works. I can't change colors. I can't do anything. Nothing is gonna, nothing is working currently. Now, for me to get this to work is gonna take me three steps. Three steps, that's all it's gonna take me to make this work. So the first thing that we need to do is we're gonna go into the card button menu. And we have this, we have this flight view model. And this flight view model is, um, it's a subclass of observable object. And basically any changes made to a variable, uh, any view that's listening for those changes makes their updates. And that's the simplest way I can explain it. Um, so right now we have a couple of things that we're keeping track of in this view model that you can see. So we have the color that's selected. We have the type for the color. So this an index position of where the color is. And then a bunch of arrays, um, we have two really, one um, that are, they're basically the same. So in Swift UI, we have some UI elements that need UI color and then other elements that need color. So I had to create two. So that's the only, uh, hopefully, uh, eventually we won't have to do that. Um, but again, there's four variables, two colors, two, one for selected color and then one for the type. Now I'm going to add the code that I'm gonna to need to do it. So the first thing I wanna do is when I select the button, I want the color that I select to be the one that, I, that changes my card. 
So that's the first thing. And that would be boom. So we have two things. We're setting the index of the type. We're setting the color, and then we're or we're, we're uh, grabbing the from the UI colors array. We're grabbing its it the color of it and setting it to selected color. So that's the first thing. And then the last thing we need to do is we have a little check mark that right now is here and it's not appearing. Um, but we wanna we want this to appear when I select it. So again, I can listen for. Um, a particular variable and each one of these separate views that are getting created will uh, tell itself to show its check mark. So on this line under render mode, I'm going to do this. So selected card type, if it's if my card type equals my index, I want you to show the check mark, otherwise hide the check mark. That's all I'm doing here. Again, that's step two. Last step, three, card view. Right now, our color is black. So if I ran, if I go back over here to the main data and I hit one of these, let's hit stop and then play again, nothing's really gonna happen. Again, we're still not there yet. We still have to fix it. So let's go back to card view and you'll notice right now it's set to a default color. It's not set to anything. So all we have to do is change this to be the color of the one that's selected and we're doing it for both. Now, both of these are done. I'm gonna go back to color menu, sorry, to um, main data. And you can already see something just happened. This one already changed to a blue. It used to be black and now it's blue. And that's because in the view model that we create, it uh, has a default color automatically. So now I hit each one of these and you will see it change colors. Now the asset for the check mark is actually not in the project and that's why it's not appearing. Um, so that's, I apologize for that. I didn't check that part, but you can see that each time, uh, each color I select, it changes to the correct color that I pick. So again, I did that in, in three basic steps. Once it was set up, again, it could have taken four or five, but again, easy enough. Now, the last one we're gonna do is gonna be an API uh, and it's gonna be old school, not no GraphQL, unfortunately. Um, and so here I'm using what's known as uh, an app called Makun. And Makun is a way for me to be able to build apps locally without having to have an API. I can write everything that I need, set up all the data, get everything I wanna do and run it locally on my device through Xcode. Um, if I needed to do sign-ins or whatever, I have it here. I have a project coming up where I don't have a developer. And let's say I needed the developer to have a particular structure. I could basically do the whole thing and then hand them the JSON and then he can work on the JSON on his side, match the JSON and then the app works. So. Right now we're looking, this is a pulling in airport locations and it's just, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna display it in the list and it's, that's it. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go to this API endpoint and we're gonna do this in five steps. Um, I set up an error, um, pretty much this is boilerplate. I would already have this. Um, I have our endpoint here, but we don't have any endpoints set up and I'm pointing to our local server. So right now, if I click on this little arrow, just to verify, and I open this up in Safari, you will see that we do have a local host and the data is there. So it does exist. So if I mess it up, it's because I messed it up, not because um, Makun messed it up. So first step we're gonna do is we're going to create an endpoint for locations. So here we have um, locations, the URL, we set up the endpoint and we're saying API v1 locations. Now we can verify this locations. The uh, route is API v1 and this particular route is locations. Here's one from my book where I have games and then players and then dashboard. So you can see, you can create your, your, um, your route 
create it and then create all of your, your different pages that you want to do. And that way you can really uh, map everything out just like you would for your app. So here we have location. So we're matching that now. Step two. We're going to create a function called fetch locations. Now, this is the part where it gets a little more technical. And again, this is combine and you just have to get used to what's going on. And actually, this code I learned today, some other stuff that I'm going to redo and re uh, even simplify this even more. But we have a URL session and it, it basically creates or calling this data tasks publisher and we're requesting the URL for locations. Um, once it comes back, it's going to give us JSON data, which is what this map is going to do is take the data and and simple bring it down to where what it needs to be. And then it's going to then decode all of this JSON data that we get into an array of locations. Each um, location is mapped to the feed. So we have ID, which is ID. We have code, which is code. We have name, state, and city. So all of these map to the properties in here. And so we all we're telling it to do is create, a, you should be able to find an array of locations here. Finally, um, I like to do print just so I make sure things are going okay. Sometimes there'll be an error in the decode and it, what it'll do is it'll print. If that print isn't there, uh, I, you don't really know. So then we have the error. So if then the error shows up, if something happens, for example, if I decide to turn this off, we would get an error and I'll show that example. And then here we have another print. And then finally it maps the data down and we use this erase to any publisher is just cleaning up code. We always have to end with that so that it converts all of this to an any publisher and any publisher has two things the data plus an error. And in our case, we're gonna, we want an array of locations. Again, high level, um, it's, not, uh, it's not overly complicated, but again, it is a little bit of a learning curve there. So we're gonna go to the next step, which is, we have two more to go, um, maybe three. So now we're going to create three variables here. API, just an instance of the very uh, the class we just um, worked on. Subscription for cleaning up code again and dealing with combine technical stuff we won't get into, and then a class and then uh, a variable for an error. And then finally, we're going to create another function. And this function is gonna be another fetch locations, but this is where the publisher, where we're basically, um, we're calling the function we just created and then we're putting it on the main queue. And then we're just basically checking for a completion and what we receive. So the completion will come through, it'll tell us if, if it failed and we got some kind of error. And if we didn't, we receive the values. And all I'm doing here is I'm setting, I'm resetting my array back to zero. I'm now setting the array to the new and for whatever data is on the feed and I'm setting my error to nil. And that's all I'm going to do. Now, if I go into location selection view here, you'll see that I have a model and I'm tied into items. So basically what it's gonna do is it's gonna on uh, the last call we're gonna do. So we'll say here, is on a peer, we're gonna say fetch the locations. And that's all I have to do. I don't have to refresh anything. I don't have to do anything else. I just say fetch locations. The API call will be made. It'll run everything it's gotta run. And when, if it has items, it'll automatically load them in. So I'm gonna just run that all together. And now we have data. And again, I didn't, I, I'm not, if I, if you don't believe I'm, I can go ahead and stop this so that this feed doesn't work. And now I'll load it again. I'll hit play and I've got nothing. I've got errors. So basically it's telling me that it can't find what I'm looking for. And that's cause I turn the API off and now I'll turn it back on. All right, and then finally, I'll just run it one more time. And, the, and that's how the um, combine and integrated with SwiftUI works. 
And again, a high level, a lot of it you probably don't understand if you haven't touched Swift UI, and that's perfectly fine. But the, the point of this talk is really for you to see that um, the learning curve uh, for certain things is there, but there's a, you, there's a lot you can do right now just jumping in and starting to learn. And I feel like in another year or so, this will be even more popular. So waiting in another year from now, uh, there's people now that don't even know how to do this. And so jumping in early, you can be one of those who actually help and teach others um, because a lot of the veteran developers right now aren't getting into it yet. And they solely are. So um, hopefully this gives you a, a good enough view of a little bit of each thing in SwiftUI that I wanted to show you. Thank you very much. That was uh, very interesting. Thank you. Let's see if uh, we have some uh, questions about it. Everybody came for Ellen, so probably not. Oh, that's BS, Craig. And you're <laughs> All right, Mike, and then everyone else is yours. Okay, no we questions? Have, uh, if you open the chat, I can read the question. Oh, let me open up chat. It, it would be nice if you can either read the question or if those people who ask the question can read it because we are recording this and uh, those people watching us might wanna. Mike, you wanna ask the question? Craig, we see okay. your slide. Let me read the question. So from uh, Mike. Uh, do you have to save color button menu dot swift in the first example? I uh, thought perhaps that was why we weren't seeing the check mark. No, I was a slacker and I moved all of this stuff over to a new project and I didn't um, see that the checkbox wasn't there when I originally did it. So the asset is not in the project. Um, and I will see here, I only have left card. So um, I will find the asset and then re show you that it was just the asset was missing not not the code. Craig, we are seeing your Slack channel. So now oh. you're trying to share something. No, I wasn't, but um <laughs> I will share my other screen and then uh I will pull it up. Right. Let me pull that up and I'll show while that while someone asks another question I'll find the check mark. Another question. Okay. So from Regina, you mentioned earlier, you plan your design around SwiftUI current limitations. Do you know of any resources that maintains a consolidated rule of rules, uh, sorry, a consolidated list of this? So which are the limitations you currently know? Mm, there, honestly, the, there really isn't, the limitations are on you. Um, it's really your imagination. I always say this, if you're, when you're going to learn Photoshop, you're not going to learn one tool or two tools, you're going to go in, you're going to try and learn as many things as you know, and then utilize what you have. Um, so the limitations are really going to be based on you and what you're able to do and not do. Um, I don't, I don't have any limitations because I would just pivot to something, I would pivot to something that I can do. Um, I wouldn't let it stop me from getting the UI or UX experience I'm trying to do. So, I, I mean, it's a, it's hard to say like, oh, I, this is a limitation and that's a limitation um, because there, oh, there's, there's hundreds of ways of accomplishing something. So even if um, back when we didn't have grids, I just used two for each's. So that's, uh, is not really a limitation. It just did it a different way. Um, and there's times when I'm still using two for, two for loops because um, the V grid doesn't actually do what I'm looking to do. Um, so that's where I just change it. Another example, my friend was like, oh, I want to do two buttons in one view. And I'm like, well, you don't need to. Why are you doing it? Oh, because I did it in my other app. Well, then change your UI. Like, 
make your UI better. Don't make it worse or don't try to mimic something you did in, in UI kit is really where I'm, I'm coming from. So honestly, I would say dig in and just see what you can do. And then if you're limited at something, hit me up and I'll, I'll find a solution for you. Another question, uh, which one do you prefer yourself? Swift, Swift UI or UI kit? Also, anything you'd like to see in the next version of Swift UI? Um, I honestly, uh, Swift UI for me because of design. Um, I feel like I have more freedom now than I did back when, back in, um, uh, and UI kit. And the reason I say that is because we can utilize shapes and different things to accomplish the things that we need. So if I have uh, a design with the card and then an image and the guy's head is kind of coming over the card and I can just use a quick shape and I'm done. Where in UI kit, that would be a lot. I would have to get a graphic and bring it in and then make it a PDF so it scales. I don't have to do that. I can just basically utilize the tools that are there. Um, so I would say for design purposes, I, Swift UI for me is great. Um, for development purposes, I still like it because uh, it simplifies interactions. Um, once you get past the learning curve of Combine and, and getting feeds in, um, your code is way less than what it would be if you tried to do it. Uh, you don't have to bring in a third party library to make it work. Um, and then what do I wanna see in there? Um, honestly, I don't have any specific thing. Um, I, right now I can pretty much accomplish anything, um, that I'm looking to do. So I wouldn't say there's anything that I specifically am like, oh, I wish they would have. Um, they did. Now we have list. I, I would, if I were to say, okay, I got one. Um, so compositional layout for collection views lets you do things like, uh, center paging and different things like that. So I would say a little bit more on the lines of the kind of fine tuning customization things. Um, but honestly, I don't use list a lot because uh, it's like table view and um, I have to hack it to make it look like I want. So pretty much I stay away from list. So I'm looking for more, I guess, things that I can do, I have more freedom with that I don't have to be uh, using a lot of their default stuff that that that's probably the biggest pain in the ass is is getting rid of things I don't need. Sorry, I'm still Any looking for questions? that asset. Anybody else have a question? Hey, Greg, I've, I've got two questions. Um, you mentioned right. earlier in the in the presentation that you would give a designer, uh, like let the designer kind of come up with the design is is do you really think that Swift UI is that easy to use? Um, <laughs> For yes. most designers? Oh, um, wow. Okay. Okay. So for example, I literally, so I had one, two, three designers in there, one who was older, and then okay. the other two who were younger. The other two that were younger were getting it. The one that was older, it took her like, she keep asking me like, oh, I have a, an error. So by the end of the week, I, she'd be like, oh, I have an error. And then I would not say anything. And then never mind, I figured it out. And then, oh, okay. it, so it, and a lot of it was just getting used to code. She's used to design, not code. Right. And so it was a curly brace missing. It was always something like that. It was a curly brace or missing a parenthesis or a quote or something. But once that, like once it, you drive that home and they get comfortable, they, then I gave them projects and they brought it back to me done. Okay, cool. Um, the other question I had for you was, I noticed that in some of the main views, you have a lot of um, kind of sub views and these would yes. kind of be, I guess, what UI kit would kind of be these maybe custom controls, perhaps. Yes, yes. Uh, how much of that, you know, can you really get away with kind of putting on there before, you know, the maybe the app starts to kind of would, is there a point where you can add too many and the app no. jokes? Okay. No, so Apple is Apple is for small components, everything small, small, small. And that's because they want you to reuse it. Now, um, they started coming out with these variables. So if I go back to color button view, re-render, I'm going to show you um, the part where I messed up, which is the check mark. And then, um, come on. 
But for example, so here, color button menu view and then card view. So I'm, I'm condensing this down um, and then putting it into here now in this color, but I forgot which one I have. So later on people, they, I started seeing things. Let me go back to location. Cause I definitely did it in, sorry, here. So these little variables are basically snippets of code that, that do the same thing, but they're local. So the, the way I would do it first is I would put them in here. And then if I need to uh, use like drive state with them or do something where um, I need to use, utilize it more dynamically, then I would just create a class for it instead of, so I wouldn't create a, a class for path and then a one for airplane and then one for arrival dot. So I'm using this to, to make the smaller chunks of code and then things that I can reuse or repeat, like if it's going to be in a for loop or that kind of thing, I'll throw it into a class and make it a small view because then I can reuse it. And it, and that is some of the power of what uh, Apple can do. You can, you're only limited to, I think, 10 items inside of a stack or inside, yeah, inside of a stack. So you really want to try to limit the code that you're putting in. Now, if it's in another view, then that still has the same thing. You still want to limit what's in there. So the smaller, you, the better you are. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, why am I not? Card view, left, card button, check mark selector. That's why, because this is the name, and then asset, and then here, and then there. And then I go back. And now if I go, it's probably going to be the wrong size, because I don't think I bought, brought the right one in. But that's why this one was not working. Um, resume and there should be a check mark that pops there it is so there it, that was what was missing was just the asset um any other questions sure we have one more how is you cut how ui we, kit oh, oh yeah, i got it uh, how is ui kit and swift ui enterability is it easy it's easy it seems you have to do that often in order to many things not quite sure. Me, can you actually say what you're, that doesn't make any sense to me, uh, what you're asking? Sorry. The first part is pretty clear. How is UI kit and Swift UI? You can use them both. You have to use only one of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that you can use them both. Um, and it really just depends if you're trying to bring something in um, off the top of my head, video player is one where you'd probably have to bring it in. Um, they don't have a native one or they, they might, but it, I don't remember it working very well. Um, there's a couple of things that you would, you can bring in from UI kit and it's not a big deal. Uh, like you have to inject UI kit for many things. Mm, no, I, it just depends on your UI and your design. Um, I, you can't really do a broad stroke like that. Um, I can show you the airplane app that I have uh, that I showed up there. That is all um, that is all like this one here, this Tesla form. Uh, this is all UI kit. I'm sorry, this is all uh, Swift UI. Um, nothing in here is I needed to bring in. So it, it really just depends what your design is doing, what you're trying to do with it that really dictates it. And then again, that's where you make, you pivot, make changes, or you just use it. Like it's not a big deal to bring in UI kit for certain things. Um, but I haven't had a need for it. Um, I do it in the book because people want to see it, but it's not always necessary. Uh, I might have a question. Go ahead. Um, how, how how do you see the future? So this is maybe in a way similar to the introduction of Swift. Mm -hmm. So we got Swift, but we really, we didn't, we are not forced to use it. Right. Uh, so uh, we use it slowly, slowly, and we use it together with Objective-C and slowly, slowly we migrate the code. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see the future or Swift UI? Because now really we don't have to use Swift UI, right? We can go ahead and, still use UI kit. 
you can still use UI Kit. They are pushing, yeah. they are pushing it to where they want users to use Swift UI and create one app with shared resources between iPhone, iPad, Mac, and watch. So it's Apple doesn't it they always are a little subtle, but they're not. And so st storyboards, you know, when storyboards first came out, there was only like two devices. And then all of a sudden we have like, we had like seven. So, uh, and an auto layout was a part of that and they kept hinting at it. So for here, I think it's gonna be a slow gradual process again, where in maybe five years, storyboard will get deprecated or it'll be there, but not many people use it because UI kit is more common. I'm sorry, uh, Swift UI is more common and easier to get done. Um, but yeah, like this is, there's like even this blur effect, this blur effect used to be in the first version, you couldn't do this in uh, Swift UI one and then now in Swift UI two, it's a simple call. They're, they're adding on to it. And I think the more, the more you get in, in line with, you know, learning it now, you're only benefiting yourself when Apple forces you to do it because you, you know, they eventually will. Sorry, that's my dog. He always knows when to play with his toy. So I guess he decided that he doesn't want me to talk anymore. I think he heard so many, or she heard so many <laughs> talks. He's heard enough Swift, Swift UI. UI. Yeah, he's done with Swift <laughs> UI. He's like, I don't want to hear this. She can do her own talk. <laughs> do, uh, do I think Swift UI will open up, uh, might open source Swift UI? I don't know. That's a... I don't, I can't even answer that question. I have no clue. Um, but I do know that they, they were working on it. The fact that there was no breakage from Swift UI 1 to Swift UI 2 is huge. And I think they were mindful of that with, when, Swift, when Swift came out. Swift was like somewhat different in, in the way they had to go a certain way. Where Swift UI, I think they were very mindful of not like making stuff. Um, basically break and literally um, my projects opened up in the new Xcode and I didn't have any compiler errors. So I think they, they're they helping, helping us and not having to relearn everything again. So um, I, I, I don't, I can't answer the might be the open source part, but I, I think that's, it's definitely, um, it's a good thing I, for them to not change it in the two years because they the Apple will change something in a heartbeat and they didn't. So that's, I guess that's a good thing. You can go get a Swift UI one book and it'll still work in Swift UI two. Um, you need to use Swift UI for the new iOS 14 widgets. Yes, I was uh, the new widgets and some of the other things they announced are all strictly Swift UI. So that's another sign that Apple is pushing towards this. Um, so I, I guess that's kind of a, a clue that they don't care about storyboard or UI kit. Um, and again, once you get into it, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it really is easy. It's not, it's not that difficult mindset has to change, but that's, I think the, some people's mindset don't want to change, but it's really not, you know, I've never bashed my head in on something. I, I usually just kind of step away, like in the beginning, October, when I first started the book, I had. I literally, the day it was announced, I started doing design when I was at WWDC um, the day of. I had a design, I put it in Swift UI. Every day I went to labs and talked to them and I would get new information and then just go back to the room, do more stuff, come back and have a whole new thing. And they're like, you did all this in this amount of time? I'm like, yeah, because I only have a week and if I didn't stay up all night doing it, I would never know. So that's how I learned. I learned quick and then, and then, after that API came out, they changed a lot. So then it, that's when that's when it gets frustrating because then they start changing things. But um, it's been pretty steady since since the release of it. Okay, I have um, one more question. And after yeah. that, maybe we can wrap it up. Uh, yes, tell sir. us about your book. We talked a lot before we let people in. But mm -hmm. <laughs> can you tell us about your book? What's the book? When it's coming? Where they can people can get it? Sure. So um, what you see on the screen, this is one of the apps we build in the book. Um, it covers two iOS, I'm sorry, two watch apps, one where you build like graphs and charts. Um, the other one is a draft app. Um, and then if you go on my timeline for the dev meet, you'll see I have pictures of each one and videos all on my timeline. And Ellen can attest I probably know the hell out of her when I post but um, I 
there's a lot of stuff on there, but you do two watch, two phone, two iPad. Um, the um, second app on the watch is an NBA draft app, which uses cards and uses the digital crown to flip through the cards. Um, this one is a form which we kind of customize and redo. And then we do some API calls um, with Codable by sending a push request instead of fetching data. Um, the app two on this one is a financial app. That's where the, the card button thing came from that you saw in the demo. Um, the uh, fourth app, I'm sorry, the, the fifth app is a um, sports news app, which basically we use APIs, Moncoon, and um, it's on the iPad landscape. And then the other one is a CloudKit app that's a shoe POS system. And that uses um, CloudKit to drive its data. Um, all of the apps I do design and as much design as I can. And then I challenge you to do some of them. I give design specs in there. So if you're one that wants to just like figure out how to do it and then go through the book, it's set up that way. So you can go any kind of way that works, but you have design specs. It has basically all the fonts, all of the colors, uh, spacing, everything's there and you can have at it and then go through the book and see how I did it or go through the book and then go through the specs. Um, I kind of just gave you specs so people could figure out why and how. And um, yeah, so right now I the book should be out November 10th, 15th. I'm probably about seven days away from doing everything I need to do and then it's unpacked. Uh, if you order a printed book, it is, um, right now I have a coupon, I'll post that um, uh, I'll give that to you guys so uh, you can post it somewhere. You can get a discount and now it's uh, discounted for all over the country. Uh, so if you're gonna, if you're not in the States, then I have um, one coupon code. And then if you're in the States, you can use Amazon and order from there. Um, and those are on printed books. And again, it's print on demand. So it may take a little longer. If you're looking for eBooks, all of that, it will just be ready as soon as they're ready to uh, sell. So um, whatever is easier for you, but that's basically what my book is about. And I'm ready for it to end. Sounds great. <laughs> send it, uh, please send it to me. Or I'll post it on the, on our, um, LinkedIn, uh, account. Let me paste here our, uh, link. Uh, of course people can, uh, uh, look for your name. <laughs> yes. They can find you online. Yes. The dev me on Twitter. I'm on there and I jumped in the recently I had a young guy, uh, I think he's from Spain or Brazil. And um, he was working on API and he was doing it like in a, in a way that I could help. And so I literally Saturday, I think it was Saturday or Friday night at like eight or nine o'clock, I jumped on zoom with him and fixed this code. And then, the, and then a few days later, he still had issues and we jumped in again on another zoom. So if I have the time, especially once this book is done, if you're stuck on something, you get my book, you're lost, whatever, just hit me up and I'll set up a time. We'll go through it and I'll explain it in another way that may help you, but I'm here to help. So the whole point of this is, is to share knowledge. Um, and so if you need, if you need an assistant or just help or how to get through it or how to break down design, I, I have no problem showing you. So just, just ask. <laughs>